Vandenberg Air Force Base. 64,000 acres of California coastline. The major home of the big rockets on the west coast. An operational launch base for intercontinental ballistic missiles. It is also the center of our training program for the crews that will man our missile bases of all kinds, for both ICBMs and IRBMs. For these crews, in fact, for all base personnel, there can be many types of danger, big or little at one time or another. Fortunately, these are only potential dangers, the kind that don't have to cause trouble. If all personnel learn and follow, the regulations that have been carefully worked out to protect them. These regulations begin on the north-south highway on the east side of the base at the main gate of Vandenberg. This entrance, normally used by all incoming personnel, is the beginning of the large area where such personnel, military or civilian, may find ways to get into difficulties of one sort or another. This is also where we begin rigid enforcement of base speed limits for better than ordinary reasons. Not only because all vehicle accidents are potentially deadly, but also because some of the vehicles that you could tangle with on this base may be loaded with materials that just cannot stand hard knocks of any kind. In other words, from here on in, get it firmly in mind that the speed signs and all the other warning signs you see on this base mean exactly what they say. Now to orient you on a quick tour of the high spot, let's switch over to a map. As the road heads roughly southwest down through the base, we find over here on the right the Cape Hart housing area. A little further on are airmen's dormitories. The BOQs near the reception center then various offices, technical training schools, shops and trailer courts. Well down to the end of the road, located away out in the boondocks in order to secure adequate isolation from other major activities and housing areas, is the re-entry vehicle training and checkout facility. This is the home of the missile warheads. We certainly don't expect any accidents at this site, but the isolation is a basic safety requirement. As we mentioned earlier, the main gate is the entrance used by most incoming personnel. New missiles arrive at the base via Pine Canyon Road, which turns off the highway at a point somewhat south of the main gate. This winding two-lane thoroughfare is a designated heavy truck route and runs roughly northwest into the base. Along this lower crossroad is located what we might very loosely call our industrial section, including heavy maintenance shops, contractor facilities, inspection and assembly buildings, and the liquid oxygen plant. First stop for an incoming missile is at a missile assembly building, which has technical facilities to prepare a missile for delivery to the launch emplacement. In these buildings, potential dangers are generally of the standard industrial types. Misuse of pressurized gases, electrical circuits, sharp implements, dropping weights on your toes. These are the most convenient ways to cause injury or damage. However, once the missile is checked out and ready to move on to the big show, the chances for accidents through inattention or lack of forethought are much greater. The Atlas and Titan missiles go out 13th Street toward the northwest and on out to the appropriate launching complexes for those birds. The Thor missile route is out Tang Air Road. On the right of this road is our 8,000-foot airstrip. A bit farther on the left are located the igloos, where we store exotic fuels, acids, 
and explosive components such as igniters, squibs, and retro rockets. This is another isolated area. And here again, the warning signs are not kidding. They mean exactly what they say. The four launching complexes are located roughly a mile past the igloos at the end of this same road. It is out on the complex, whether they are for the Thor intermediate range ballistic missiles or for Titan, which uses the underground silos, and the Atlas, our intercontinental ballistic missiles, where the chances for really large scale trouble could begin to show up. But remember that they don't have to be any more than chances. They don't have to be the kind of trouble that will injure or kill somebody. Pressure can be a hazard, and high pressure an even greater hazard. Gases under pressures of thousands of pounds per square inch are stored in bottles or tanks at the launch emplacement and transferred from one container to another by means of hose-like flexible lines or by use of deceptively thin and innocent looking rigid lines. Should lines like these rupture or uncouple due to improper handling while still under pressure, they could flail around with a force capable of destroying almost anything or anybody in their path. Before working with any of these compressed gases, you'll find it well worthwhile to learn and follow the regulations for their handling. And to believe in the signs you find around them. The pad area is also where the missile propellants come close together for the first time. And that closeness sets up a new assortment of hazards that did not exist before. Of the primary propellants that are normally stored in quantity on the launch emplacement, we are likely to think first of liquid oxygen. Before you ever get very near this propellant, you'll get plenty of briefings on what its terrific coldness can do to unprotected flesh. You'll also learn that almost any organic material gets a wild desire to burn, or in some cases even explode, in the presence of either liquid oxygen or the concentrated and invisible vapors of the oxygen. If you work in these vapors, they can saturate your clothing and make you a potential bonfire for the next hour or so, even after you leave the area. All it takes is an ignition source, like a spark from a cigarette, for you to get quite a bang out of those vapor-filled clothes. This exact thing has happened, and it has cost lives. Liquid nitrogen, not a propellant, but also used in the big missiles, presents no fire hazard at all but it is even colder than liquid oxygen. For these reasons, the full outfit of protective clothing for men handling any of the liquid gases is required. Each item of clothing is selected to protect you from some particular hazard. Frequently a hazard that some earlier and less protected worker may have learned about the hard way. Safety showers and eye wash basins are located near every launch emplacement. In fact, everywhere on the base where liquid gases are handled. The man on the cold and wet end of any liquid gas spillage should immediately get under one of the showers, protective clothing and all. The floods of water will remove the fire hazard and also remove the spilled liquid that might otherwise inflict a severe frostbite or skin burn. The other primary fuel component that is normally stored in quantity near the emplacement is called RP-1, or rocket propellant. This fuel is very much like jet fuel, a cousin of the kerosene family, and not much more dangerous, so long as it's isolated. However, as we mentioned earlier, this is the first place in which the RP-1 and the liquid oxygen come close together, first in storage and then inside the missile, where they are separated only by a very thin metal bulkhead. During the propellant loading of a missile with these two liquids, or almost any fuel for that matter, 
we require that all personnel be evacuated from the area, or else proceed to the thick-walled and safe concrete blockhouse, from which the propellant loading operation is conducted by remote controls. The prime reason for this great caution is that in the presence of liquid oxygen, the rocket propellant will not only burn with a volcanic fury, but the mixture also becomes a potential explosive. It may be triggered by either fire or shock into a detonation nearly as violent as 45 tons of TNT, in the case of an atlas. Because of the potential hazard factor, every training launcher at Vandenberg is equipped with an array of Firex nozzles, which can be turned on by controls on the launch pad itself or from inside the launch control blockhouse to produce a deluge of water. This is very effective against any minor fire, though it would, of course, be useless against the full fuel loads of either the Thor or Athens. Our film records show what can happen even without an explosion when full loads of propellants are prematurely mixed by a missile accident. The effect is very picturesque, very expensive, and very dangerous. No present-day firefighting equipment can cope with the violence of these fires until the bulk of the fuel is burned out. Precaution would do any good if, in violation of safety regulations, any personnel were present in an exposed position. For this reason, our major reliance in launch area safety has to go beyond individual safety discipline. It lies in keeping people away from potentially dangerous operations to the greatest extent that is practical. To make a system out of this philosophy, we use an arrangement of areas, or zones. The first is a hazard area of 150 foot radius around the Thor launcher and 400 feet for the Atlas. Safety caps must be worn by all personnel working inside this hazard area. During any hazardous operation, such as the installation of the destruct package or pressurization, all non-essential personnel must remain outside the area. The next zone is a danger area of 1,000 foot radius for any Thor fueling or static firing. This radius would be 1,200 feet for an atlas. During danger periods, all essential personnel must be inside the launch control blockhouse, while non-essential personnel must proceed to designated safe fallback points outside the danger zone. Both signs and roadblocks are used at the fallback point and on any other entry roads to control access to the danger areas. In addition, an extensive system of klaxon horns, green or amber to red lights, and loud speakers go into action to inform personnel that a danger period exists. This fallback area is also the region where the missile accident emergency team normally stands by, ready to support each event that involves serious risk. Firefighting, rescue, ordnance disposal, and emergency first aid equipment, with vehicle and helicopter transport, are ready for instant action in case of any unexpected fire, explosion, or other accident. All of these procedures and precautions add up to a high degree of safety in pre-launch operations. Next comes the question of safety after launching. Missile flight safety, we call it, which involves a still wider area system. For this, we establish what we call a flight hazard corridor, extending out in the direction the missile is programmed to travel. Surrounding the flight hazard corridor is a caution zone. Access to this zone during launches is restricted to personnel required for normal operations in the area. Presence of personnel in the flight hazard corridor itself is further restricted to personnel working on essential jobs protected in strong shelters. Our blast-offs are not always in exactly the same direction. Of course, the entire corridor is redrawn or switched around 
as needed to fit any scheduled change of flight direction, or launch azimuth, as it's usually called. Whatever direction is selected, roadblocks backed up by vehicle and helicopter surveillance make certain that no one will be inside that flight hazard corridor when a launch takes place. It may sound strange, but one of our actual safety headaches is caused by self-important spectators who try to finagle their way past the roadblocks to get a better grandstand view for themselves and their families or friends. It could turn out to be suicidal, but some of them are very determined. It just so happens that the air police are very determined too. Our safety regulations, of course, forbid the firing of any missiles while either passenger or freight trains are using the lines of the railroad that runs through the missile flight hazard corridor. The locating and warning of fishing boats or other shipping that may be off this coast is not a Vandenberg responsibility, but that of the Navy, which operates the Pacific Missile Range for the Department of Defense. At any rate, all dangerous areas are finally cleared Countdown proceeds to the launching of a missile. Our flight safety criteria require that any missile which strays outside an allowable path must be destroyed in midair by a radio signal before it can become dangerous to the base or any nearby communities. The radio signal which triggers the missile's destruct package is emitted by the command destruct transmitter on a hill overlooking most of the base. The signal originates when the missile flight safety officer stationed in the instrumentation control center closes the destruct switch. The big problem for this officer is to be certain just where the speeding missile is at each given moment, where it is heading, and whether these items add up to the safe behavior that was programmed into the missile. His information comes from three different systems of instrumentation, which are, in essence, backing each other up. The early path of the lifting missile is followed by simple devices called optical sky screens, or precision radar equipment. Each sky screen observer keeps the crosshairs of his instrument trained on the rising missile. He can verbally report the progress of the bird through an open phone line. In addition, every movement of his tracking device, and therefore the movements of the missile, are shown on strip recorders to the right of the missile flight safety officer in the ICC building for comparison with pre-computed lines that show the path the missile should be following. Another device with longer range capability is known as COTAR. It also displays missile tracking data on a plotting board in front of the safety officer. With this system also, he can compare the actual flight path of the missile against lines that show the programmed path. To obtain the data for these plots, two COTAR antenna fields some distance apart pick up radio signals from a transmitter in the missile and feed them into a computer which interprets them for display on the plotting board in the ICC building. Our third system for keeping tabs on the bird uses three skin tracking radars, each working independently and fully capable of handling the tracking problem in case of failure of the other two radars. These radars, located close to the ICC building, lock onto and begin tracking the missile shortly after liftoff. The radar data go into the ICC building, and there the radar control officer can switch the automatically plotted tracks of whichever radar he chooses onto data boards already prepared for his quick reference. With these sources of information, the missile flight safety officer follows each missile until it is several hundred miles out over the ocean. If it becomes necessary to destroy the missile, he must do it quickly enough to ensure that no major fragments will impact outside of the flight hazard corridor. To make certain that this is accomplished successfully, the backup precautions include not only the radars, but also two destruct transmitters with automatic switchover in case of a failure, two power supplies, two receivers inside the missile, 
in fact, two of practically every important item in the system, so that whenever the time comes that the missile flight safety officer must press the destruct button, the reaction in the missile, possibly miles away by this time, will be sure fire. The system works without fail. But remember, in spite of the near perfection that we've built into the flight safety system, we do not intend to use it except as a last resort. Our mission at Vandenberg is not the destruction of missiles. It is the job of safely transporting and erecting, fueling, and finally launching the missiles. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Start. One, two, Lift off! Five, six, seven, eight, nine. Launching missiles so that they will fly where they are programmed to fly. Whenever and wherever the needs of the free world may require that they fly. <laughs>